Hey, Deserving Listeners, it's time to continue watching The Vow on HBO. Let's get to the show. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. As I always say, never use these videos as a replacement for therapy. If you need a therapist, get one. You deserve it. Let's get to the show. The Guinness Book of World Records said that he was one of the top scorers on an IQ test ever given. One of the top three problem solvers in the world. One of the top three problem solvers in the world. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> One of the top three problem solvers in the world. Okay, so l let's let's speculate as to how that was determined. So they measured everyone on the planet with a some kind of problem solving test, and Keith Raniere was out of seven and a half billion people one of the top three problem solver and. Even if you did do that, which of course is ridiculous, how would you define someone's ability to problem solve? I, I'd really love, love to see that measure. <laughs> I, I mean, the reason why I'm laughing is, because, you know, if someone just came up to me and said, I met this guy and he is the one of the best problem solvers of the world, I'd be like, okay, whatever, you know, you know this guy and you respect him. But of course, Nexium is trying to market itself. They're trying to get recruits, which means money and power and more recruits who recruit other people, then it's more power and more money and more influence. And of course, it makes sense to promote your vanguard, your cult leader as some transcendent human being, something very special, because they know that that's what's gonna work. If you elevate your leader and you say your leader is closer to God, or you say your leader is a genius and one of the top three problem solvers of the world, Scientology did this as well, and if you give that person a tremendous amount of power, that person can grant you to the next level. They can say that you have, uh, you are enlightened or you're special. Or something. And then all eyes are on that person. It primes you to want to please that person. It primes you to believe everything they say is brilliant and funny and interesting. And so that's why they're doing this, I'm guessing. I don't know their motivation, of course, but if I was going to create a cult, <laughs> And, and I wanted to manipulate a bunch of people to do whatever I said, uh, you would definitely have to have this element because history shows that they always have that element where the leader is some, something special, something beyond human. Straight path is the term we used for the ranking system, the sashes. It represented you moving up within the company. And in order to go up the straight path, you had to keep taking curriculum, enroll people, and most importantly, you had to get rid of your disintegrations. All right, so, wow, explicitly described. I don't know if this graphic is accurate or not, but that from the report and from this graphic, they're saying that in order to move up the ranks and you have very visual representations of that that will mark to everyone, I am higher than you, you, one, you need to take courses, and that means spending money in all likelihood. I'm almost positive of that. Two, you need to recruit other people. In order to move up the ranks, you must recruit others. Imagine if I did that as a therapist. It would be disgusting for me to ask a therapist, to ask a client, in order for you to get better, in order for you to meet your goals, in order for me to move to the next level to help you, you need to recruit five clients for me. You need to tell five people to hire me as their therapist. That's disgusting. Is it not disgusting? It's unethical. You could get obviously sued for that sort of thing. That is wrong. And for programs like this, because they don't have ethical codes and they don't have a professional organization that they have to answer to, they don't have a licensing process that they have to answer to, they will blatantly have this in there. Now, some religions will have this in there as well, very explicit messages of if you want to be closer to God, you've got to bring people to this church. Sometimes it's within a good mindset. They're thinking, well, look, you know, Mark, you brought 12 people in. That means you have given 12 people the opportunity to experience the same wonderfulness that you've experienced and that we've experienced. So what a great thing you've done for society, all right? That's, that's one way of looking at it. And, I, and if those 12 people are happy that they were dragged to it, then great, I suppose. So that's on one side. On the other side, 
It is trying to trick a bunch of other hapless individuals into spending more money so that you can have more money and power. So that's interesting that they're showing that to us, is that you had to recruit people. Again, there's nothing wrong with say, hey, you know what, I found this thing, uh, you know, maybe you want to check it out. But I know people who have been dragged and socially coerced into socially coercing other people to show up for things like this. Amway was this way back in the day. Maybe it still is. It's not cool. The whole five day was set up with these deep questions. Like you start right from the beginning. Things like, what's the thing you most regret in your life? Who do you most love in the world? Or who do you feel you need to make something right with? All right, so we're getting a glimpse of the sort of activities that they would do. Now, I will say that this is common to these kinds of groups is that ground level, a lot of times what they're doing is fantastic. And most of us could probably get behind. And when you look at it from afar, like when you look at Scientology from afar, if you're not in Scientology, I'm not, it, it will look as if the whole thing is just an evil organization that's out to harm people. But when you actually ask people, particularly at the ground level, at the sort of introductory level, the lowest level, the people who are just taking the classes, they'll often talk about how helpful it was for them. I know people who took low-level Scientology courses and thought it was fine. You know, it was helpful, it was sort of like therapy in a sense. Uh, landmark, this sort of thing, Nexium, that sort of thing. It's these kinds of things. It's like explore your life. What kind of goals do you have in your life? Uh, what was the most negative relationship in your life? Why was it negative? How did it get there? What damage did it do to you? What do you need to overcome? And then you write down, you think about it, and you talk about it with other people. This can be wonderful exercises, and usually it goes in good directions. It gives people a chance to reflect, to get support, to show emotions, to reevaluate things, to make new goals, this kind of thing. It can be very, very helpful for people. And at the same time, you can have a charismatic, psychopathic leader that wants to harm other people. You can have both of those things. You can have evilness that is happening on a small level and a lot of helpful things. If you watch the Bikram yoga documentaries, it's a similar thing. A lot of people loved the Bikram yoga. They loved it. You know, at the ground level, they just got so much out of it. And yet at the top, you had someone who was, and I guess still is, mildly to severely abusing people, physically and sexually and emotionally. Nexium can have both of those things. We can look at this and see, wow, that looks like a, I, I want to do that exercise, me personally. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is we shouldn't look at these organizations or these exercises and these individuals and these activities as necessarily evil. They say it in a really nice way and they like teasing you in a way that feels like tough love. So you're doing a whole bunch of things and pretending you have no choice. You're emotionally dishonest. To you, mm -hmm. not to me. <clears throat> All right, so we just heard another little element there that it often will involve helpful confrontation. I think she used the word bullying, I'm not sure. And that's present in Landmark from what I understand. It's present in, in other kinds of things and it can be very helpful. Sometimes it, it's a, you need that. It can be used for good, it can be used for neutral, it could also be used for evil. If you're, if you're going to try to beat people down and brainwash them, one of the things that you need to do is you need to get them off kilter. You need to make them second guess themselves. You need to make everyone think that you're the master of wisdom and thought and intelligence and, you, and everyone else is stupid and they need to listen to you or else you're going to punish them emotionally. It's a, it's a common cult technique to brainwash people, to get control, not only of behavior, but over the mind. If you can control people's mind, you can control everything. And to break people down in boot camp, for example, at least in the movies, they depict this where you have a drill sergeant who you know gets into your head, makes you feel like you are a worm underneath their boot. And when you, they get you to that state, then they can reprogram you. The ethical mission that I did resonate with was this mission of helping people integrate emotional reactions. Right. Again, I'm hearing a lot of language of Gestalt therapy. They use terminology like integration. Other kinds of therapies do as well. Psychodynamic therapy, interpersonal therapy will sometimes use terms of integration. So 
it either is a coincidence that they developed this scientific technology that is exactly like gestalt and schema and psychodynamic therapy, or they knew about it and they just rebranded it as if they had invented it. And we start talking about, okay, let's turn this into a film. Keith Ranieri thought it would be a good idea for us to study other people with Tourette's to see if we could have an effect in a consistent way. The participants came to Albany. We filmed them working with Nancy Salzman and the team. When I met Isabella, she had Tourette's. All right, so Tourette's and tic disorders are pretty complex. There's a lot of science that I could go into about it. It's not a specialty of mine, but I know enough about it to say this, is that it's very difficult to change for some people. For a lot of people, it's just a matter of managing it, meaning that you just tell everyone around you, by the way, I'm, I'm going to be doing this odd movement with my face or my neck, or I'm going to be doing this thing, or I might suddenly shout words that are inappropriate, or I might blink my eyes really hard. Uh, you know, there's various different tics that people will have. I might uh, have a certain routine, sort of a compulsive routine that I do that I need to do in order to calm myself down. And there's a lot of reasons why people will develop this. It can be trauma related, obviously. It can be neurological. It can be medication based. It can be brain damage. There's a lot of different reasons that seem to be causal or factors that genetics, obviously, that can uh, result in this sort of thing. Now, I'm guessing that they're going to show us a scene in which Keith Raniere and the other woman are going to cure someone's Tourette's with their scientific technology. Is that possible? Sure. There's a, a lot of cases where uh, people will try various different therapies and none of them will work and then one will work. For some people, medications work. For some people, uh, from my memory of the research, deep brain stimulation might work. For other people, placebo might work for other people, relationships might work for other people, uh, trauma recovery might work for other people, uh, emotional regulation, diet, sleep, uh, working on uh, control, trying to break habits and uh, uh, allow yourself to have some of the distress of of not doing it because you know you have this mounting stress is like I got it I have this itch I want to I want to do that thing with my neck and uh, it's it's mounting anxiety as I'm trying to do it and to get used to that over time to repeat that through habit can sometimes also reduce it for some people for sure there's a lot of different things and so is it possible that for whatever reason they their technique helped someone with Tourette's for sure absolutely I would have a hard time believing that if 100 people came to them with Tourette's that they would be able to reduce all of those 100 people's symptoms. Uh, that would be very, very un unlikely given the science. We don't use any drugs. The only thing that we use is a talk approach. I listen to where I think that their beliefs are limited and then I look at the stimulus response patterns that they have and I systematically disconnect them. Right, so the idea that you explore the associations, the cognitive, narrative associations that they have with the, with the tick, with the movement, that might be able to help them to have some awareness of like, well, what is that doing for you? And usually what people will say is, well, it's an uncontrollable itch or I'm, I'm feeling distress a lot of times. And so this actually, this movement actually makes me feel a little bit better. It's like smoking a cigarette when you're nervous or, um, a lot of us will actually have minor tics like this, like people will uh, click their fingers or they'll roll their tongue in their mouth or they'll, they'll dig their fingernail into their thumb or something. These are things that some, I do that. I, when I, I find myself sometimes digging my fingernail into, into my other hand. Um, and so, you know, a lot of us do this as kind of a normal human activity. It's only a disorder when it becomes much more of a problem and much more difficult to control, much more of a needed habit that interferes with life in some way. And so the idea that if you could help someone analyze where those tics are coming from, their emotions, helping them to find other ways to soothe themselves, helping them to have other tools available, giving them someone that hears them and listens to them and cares about them, uh, helping them to regulate their emotions in other ways. Can that help a percentage of people with tic disorders, OCD, and Tourette's? Absolutely, 100%. Is that going to cure everyone? No, 
uh, if if someone had out there a sure proof or even like a 90 percent rate of success of a treatment for Tourette's, that person would be a billionaire because there are so many people out there suffering. Now, in my field, you need to do research, you need to do trials, you need to publish that those data. You need people to do outside evaluations of your treatment and your outcomes. You need to track people uh, six months, uh, 18 months into the future to make sure that their symptoms don't return. You need to compare that to a control group. You need to have randomized con controlled trials to see if your treatment protocol is actually helping people greater than chance or greater than just supportive therapy, as we call it. These people, I'm guessing, are not doing those, those kinds of research projects. At the very least, it's not from an outside unbiased institution. I'm just taking a guess on that. I found that I was able to change something that most people believe is unchangeable. And now I live a life without Tourette's. The difference is staggering. It's miraculous. You go like, how the fuck is this possible? It's not miraculous. <laughs> it's not astounding. It's not surprising. Lots of people through various different therapies, as I was talking about earlier, have seen symptom reduction from those conditions, if not full rem remission at least temporarily, from those symptoms. It's not a miracle. And this is the problem with these kinds of groups is that they sell their product as if it's unique. They rebrand and they sell it as if it's unique. They sell it as if they're the only people on the planet that can do it. They probably cherry pick the data because I'm quite positive that there were people that they tr uh, helped. Uh, it's not treatment, but that they helped with Tourette's that it didn't work, or at least the symptom reduction didn't sustain over time. I'm quite sure of that because Tourette's is, can be very difficult to change for people. And they probably didn't include that. They didn't, they didn't hold that person up at the front of the classroom, right? Because that doesn't sell tickets to seats. There was such a hopeful possibility of what we could do because if we can cure Tourette's, I thought it would give ESP and Nexium validity, especially in the scientific world. Absolutely. If you could somehow demonstrate that you had developed a treatment protocol that even helped to reduce the symptoms of 10, 20% of people with Tourette's that came to you for the treatment protocol, then yeah, you would be respected by the scientific community for sure. I mean, she, was, she had her own show and she had a little following of young women who looked up to her. Hi. Hey. You know me. You know, <laughs> you know me. Um, I'm Allison. I've been an actress since I was... Uh, my past dog, Chloe, was named after her character on Smallville. So we got Bowsart, Galactica, Smallville, Star Wars. Definitely speaking my language with the people they are recruiting. <laughs> They're going to crumble. All right, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle in which I watch The Vow on HBO and react to it. Let me know what you think about what I've been saying in the comments. I'm curious. I'm always curious about what you have to say. Do you agree? Do you, do you disagree? What are your stories? Do you, do you have any memories that come to mind as we're talking about this sort of thing or as you're watching this thing? And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.